Hello, and welcome to this Onc Live Peer Exchange. Today, I'll be joined by a panel of leading experts in the field of breast cancer research for a very informative discussion on the latest advances in treatment. We'll be covering data that has come out over the last few months, including information from ASCO 2015, and adding important perspective on how you can use this clinical information in practice. My name is Adam Brufsky, and I'm a professor of medicine at the University of Pittsburgh, co-director of the Women's Comprehensive Cancer Center at McGee Women's Hospital at UPMC, and associate director for clinical investigation at the University of Pittsburgh Cancer Institute. Participating today in our very distinguished panel, this is actually one of the most distinguished panels we've had in quite a while here, is Dr. Carlos Arteaga, professor of medicine and cancer biology, director of the Center for Cancer Targeted Therapies, director of the Breast Cancer Program, and associate director for clinical research at the Vanderbilt Ingram Cancer Center of Vanderbilt University. Dr. Joyce O'Shaughnessy, Chair of Breast Cancer Research at U.S. Oncology and a medical oncologist at Texas Oncology and Baylor Charles A. Sammons Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. Dr. Edith Perez, Deputy Director of the Mayo Clinic Cancer Center, practicing in Jacksonville, Florida. Dr. Debu Tripathi, Professor and Chair of the Department of Breast Medical Oncology at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. And finally, last but definitely not least, Denise Yardley, a senior investigator of breast cancer research at the Sarah Cannon Research Institute of Tennessee Oncology in Nashville. So thank you for joining us and let's begin. Let's first start by talking about the latest information on biomarkers in breast cancer and how they're used. And before we start talking about biomarkers for therapy, I think biomarkers potentially uh, for genetic risk I think are very important. Um, and the first thing really to kind of talk about uh, is this recent data that's come out on PALB2. Uh, Edith, can you kind of tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I'd be happy to. There has been really a tremendous expansion on the evaluation of biomarkers for breast cancer, thinking of germline mutations for predisposition, as well as prognostic and predictive uh, markers in the tumors to help us understand natural history as well as benefits of therapy. The story of PALB2, uh, it's very interesting because, you know, with advances in DNA sequencing, now it is possible to do multi-gene panels for predisposition of breast cancer. And based on several studies that uh, have been performed over the last few years, it is clear that uh, patients with uh, mutations of PALB2 have an increased predisposition for developing uh, breast cancer. And the ultimate risk of developing breast cancer may be as high as 33%. And that number, obviously, is something to pay attention to in our clinical practices. Yeah. So, I mean, we have all these genes, you know, we have other ones that are coming out, uh, something called BRCA3. Uh, Carlos, what do you think of BRCA3? Is it anything? Uh, well, I thank you for the question. I don't think BRCA3 is ready yet, but uh, it, it, it is a locus in chromosome 13 that was found to be associated with BRCA2. Uh, but, however, uh, it wasn't associated with increased risk in the family, the kindreds that were studied first. Um, and there's not a gene yet as in that locus that can be identified. So, so it's very early, but, uh, but it was the association of BRCA2 that, that raised a flag, but I think it's not ready to be used. We, there are a lot of research has to be done in it first before that. So we have all of these new mutations. We have all of these panels now. They're cheap. Let me throw out one question before we kind of go any further. Do you think instead of doing these panels now, we'll actually do whole genome sequencing or whole genome sequencing on just peripheral blood DNA. Debbie, what do you think? You think we'll end up doing that? It's just as expensive. It's like 2,000 bucks well, or something one, one like thing, that. One thing that's really important to recognize about multi-panel testing is th the more you study a gene and study the families, the more precise you can be about saying whether a particular aberration is truly what's called deleterious or not. For BRCA1 and 2, when we first introduced the test, about 20% of the results were variants of unknown significance. We didn't know what to do with them. As we got more information and could study the family, that number is down into the single-digit percentages now. So as we start doing multi-panel testing for PALB2 and for some of the other genes, the, the variant of unknown significance rate is much higher. And so it impairs our ability to really tell patients what to do. And this is something that all of us who are ordering these tests need to understand when we counsel our patients. Now, certainly for your very high-risk patient who, who develops breast cancer in their 20s, a very strong family history, you do need to start looking beyond BRCA1 and 2. You need to look at P53 and so on. Uh, so I think you have to do it in a very measured fashion. And this is why it's so important to have genetic counselors who are overseen by a medical geneticist help make these decisions as to who should get tested with panel testing. So to your question, I do think that someday we will be using germline whole gen uh, genome sequencing. But 
every bit of information is going to carry different amounts of reliability. Yeah, and I just want to kind of raise it to the panel. I mean, I think that in my practice, the problem is not that we can do the sequencing. It's really easy to do. I mean, it's inexpensive. You know, it, it can be done. It's now down, you know, to maybe $1,500 to get a panel of 20 or 30 genes. It's the interpretation. Our, genomic, our genetic counselors are backed up six months. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that everybody's experience, yeah. Edith? Yeah. Is that your experience? Yeah, we, we need more gen uh, genetic counselors throughout the nation. Uh, right. That's absolutely for sure. And to expand on this situation is the issue of uh, testing not in patients with a strong family history, but in right. patients who are diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer. Right. Mm -hmm. No, I mm -hmm. agree. And I think that, in fact, you know, BRCA status may be actually an indicator of how to treat them. We'll get to that later. You know, but what do you do when you start sequencing, Joyce? You start sequencing people and, you know, say you sequence someone because you want to treat them with some new BRCA drug, you know, like a Leparib or something like that, and you find germline mutations. Do we now have an obligation to talk to the family? What do mm -hmm. we do? What do you do with that sort of testing? What do you do when that happens? Yeah, if it does. There's a lot of controversy. In fact, um, just re just in the last week in New England Journal of Medicine, there's beginning to be some pushback from real genetic experts making the point that until we can really do better cancer risk estimates, contralateral risk estimates, what do we do with the ovaries, that we shouldn't be doing these panels. So they, they think that the technology is getting a little bit ahead of what we can do with it right now, not just the variants, which is one issue, but like even PAL-B2, what's the risk of contralateral? What's the risk of ovarian cancer? I mean, we don't even know that, and that's one of the better ones, you know? I mean, so there's some pushback coming on here with the germline, but I think to Adam's question too, at ASCO last year, there was a whole session on this, about this incidental findings when you do the germline. And um, the, um, uh, the expert panels, basically, there's two different views. One said you have to actually have people essentially sign consent saying that if something incidental is found, that it needs to be discussed with the family and, you know, even on a research uh, trial. But, other, but the other, um, other experts say not necessarily. So... Um, I know myself, and when we do this, I, I do. If when we find an incidental, which we have done in, in, in doing somatic, you know, on the actual tumor tissue, if we find something that looks like it could be in the germline, I, I, I call, the, I call yeah. the patient, I call the family, and make sure. Th and um, unfortunately, a lot of people don't follow through because they don't have that relationship with you is what I'm finding. So it's a little bit of, it's a, it's a, bit of a conundrum, but um, I think the, the incidental finding is, is is a very, very important issue, and I think we all probably should err on the side of discussion, disclosure, conversation, yeah. my, own, my opinion. So, I mean, I'll give you an example. You know, we'll take CDH. I mean, you know, if you do a foundation one or a test like that, I'm finding some CDH mutations, and that is a hereditary mutation. What are you supposed to do? Go to the rest of the family? you know, and tell them about CDH and send them to a genomic a genetic counselor? I mean, Carlos, what do we do now? Um, well, these are all important uh, questions where we're going to have to discuss this as a society, I'm afraid, you know. I'm going to have patients involved and see what do they want because um, I know we're, we, we are going to be, we're talking about the germline DNA right now, but many of us are also sequencing the tumor genome, which is different. And many argue, and I agree with that position, that in order to accurately interpret that tumor genome, you need to sequence the germline DNA. So we're going to run into situations like the one you described, that we have a fortuitous finding of a germline alteration that marks that patient and that family for a risk that they were not anticipating. Again, these are discussions that we need to have as a society and what to do with them. I think the other option is not to look. And I don't know that is the right solution either. Once we decide to look, you know, the cat's out of the bag, I think. We're going to look. Yeah. I mean, Denise, at, at Sarah Cannon in, in, the, in the Sarah Cannon network, do you have genetic counselors for people across your network? No, um, we don't. We have it through um, our hospital-based um, person that does our genetic counseling. And then a lot of the insurances now, I think before we are able, able to consent patients, um, there's several insurers that have an off-site telephone um, genetic counselor. And so before I can even do the testing or consent, they have to go through that. Um, and it's interesting. I just had a patient uh, this week that I saw who I talked to and I said, you know, how, would the, where'd you get your information about your genetic testing? And she said, oh, somebody called me. 
So, you know, and I think that somewhat depersonalized it, and I don't think the patient even put much emphasis on it. It was a phone call about something she didn't understand. It wasn't a BRCA1 or 2, it was another gene. Um, mm -hmm. And I think yeah. there's a big danger with that when it becomes that remote, and it, mm -hmm. I, I didn't have access to it either. Um, but so if it's you're, interesting. But again, if you're an oncologist, you know, uh, an oncologist who mm -hmm. maybe is not practicing in a major cancer center like all of us are, you know, what are you going to do if you don't have access to a genetic counselor? You know, or the genetic counselor, you could see one at a university, but it's like a six-month wait. You know, and you don't have time to sit down and go through it. You don't even know, understand half of it. What, do you, what do you, should we do? What should we tell people to do? Well, I, I think we have a responsibility uh, in academic medicine to extend our services and our expertise to, to others. Uh, first of all, to collaborate and then extend that expertise. And with more consolidation of practices and relationships with academic centers, I think this will improve somewhat. And as Carlos said, you know, at the, na the nationwide uh, level, we are looking at this issue to come up with recommendations. Okay. Uh, yeah. So in other words, so there will be, so Edith, what you're kind of implying is that there will be some sort of consensus guidelines on how to use these tests maybe in the community? Yeah, so to give you an example, I'm part of right now of a committee uh, uh, that uh, was organized by the Institute of Medicine. And they, our role in the committee is to offer recommendations related to the use of biomarkers for molecularly targeted therapies. So we're wrestling with all of these issues and hopefully the recommendations will be helpful to all of us in, in practice as well as uh, researchers.